My name is Scott Papik, and this podcast is called Fight For It. As long as I can remember, I've been curious when it comes to people. And if I could put my finger on it, it's maybe I'm looking for an edge, or maybe I'm searching for help to get through something. My professional career has been a little interesting. In my early 20s, I was really lost until I lied and found myself into commercial radio. Well, I just lied because I needed to get an internship and get a foot in the door. And it was amazing. All these passionate people about music was a life-changing event for me. As much fun as we were having, well, at least for me, I was making zero money. But I didn't let it stop me. And I stuck with it for 16 years. It truly did pay off in the end for the sacrifice I had to put in. I've worked in several states, but I ended up the last 10 years in San Diego. Every job there is in radio, I did it. But the good thing after trying everything, I truly found my love as being a creative services slash imaging director. What that means is I write voice sometimes or work with the voice talent and produce with sound design everything you hear on the radio that is not a commercial. So if we're trying to sell tickets to our summer concert, uh, that would be something I would do. Or we're giving away tickets to see your favorite band in Hawaii, I would work on that. Or just like station events. And knowing now why I liked it so much because it really took me to my childhood of wanting to work in the entertainment business some way, somehow. And this is a whole nother story, but it was all, that all became something when Michael Jackson did the moonwalk for the first time. And I believe it was on the Academy Awards. And I said, whatever that is, I need to be a part of it. Acting just didn't work out for me. Actually, I didn't even try. So this was the closest thing I could do in the entertainment business. And then being the creative services director is all about creativity, theater of the mind, and you know the psychology of what is going to get somebody to buy or listen to our station longer. That all interests me. And then if I look back more, it's really all about storytelling. I truly believe everyone has a story Certain things move certain people. Everybody's got their stuff, um, which I'm not gonna say baggage, but we all have stuff. And I'm primarily curious about the growth from when you hit that low point and how you pick yourself up and how you excel and what you do to get to a better place. With that being said, this is a platform for the stories to happen. And we have a good one today. You have to fight through adversity to do the things you want to do. Get where you want to go and live the way you want to live. What's your story? Genevieve Paturo asked herself in 2001 at the height of a very successful marketing career in New York City, a voice that she now calls the heart voice connection told her no. After donating her time at homeless shelter, Paturo recognized the need that children have for pajamas and a bedtime story to help them feel secure and loved. Pursuing her calling, she quit her promising career, took the leap and founded the hugely successful Pajama Program. Almost 20 years later, Genevieve's Pajama Program has delivered 6 million magical gifts of new pajamas and new books to children throughout the US. She is known as a leader in the self-improvement genre, a motivational speaker, consultant, and is writing. How one pair of pajamas changed everything. She inspires others to listen to their heart voice connection in pursuing their passion to achieve success. She's been featured on Today, Oprah, GMA, The Early Show, CNN, Fox and Friends, O Magazine, Forbes, and The Wall Street Journal. A little show note here, at about 16 minutes, the audio is a little off, but it only lasts about a minute, 45 seconds. So just wanted to give you a heads up. The Fight For It Podcast. Welcome to the Fight For It Podcast, Genevieve Pratero. How are you today? I'm fine. Thank you for having me. You are a keynote speaker and nonprofit founder who emboldens and empowers others to step out of their comfort zones and create a life they love, or as I like to say, find their pajamas. What does that mean? Well, 
I spent most of my uh, teen and college years wanting to climb that corporate ladder. That was my dream. I wanted to be Mary Tyler Moore. And I really didn't see any traditional career for me. So I didn't see family as my priority. I saw climbing the corporate ladder. And being the first of four kids um, in an Italian traditional household, it was a little, it was a little uh, tricky. But when I graduated college, I was on my way in New York City, working in radio first and then in TV. And I worked night and day to make it to what I thought would be, you know, the pinnacle of the international entertainment business in New York City. And I worked really hard. And one day, while I was just mulling around my pretty apartment outside of Manhattan, I heard a little voice ask me, if this is the next 30 years, is this enough? And for some reason, you know, we all hear voices and usually they come from your, from our heads. We don't pay attention. I never paid attention, but this one was loud and clear and it came from a different place. And I stopped and I realized that for that 20 years, I was pretty much alone or with the same type of of, of colleagues all looking for that, you know, mountaintop of success, working, traveling, running ragged and alone at the end of the day. And that voice just touched me and shocked me. And I realized I needed something more. And that was the beginning of um, a search that turned my life upside down. When that moment happened to you, how long did it take you to mustered up the courage to go in there and leave that corporate job? Well, the first thing I did, and it was it was pretty automatic, and I was really shocked. I thought, what's missing in my life? And the first thing I thought was I never had children. Now, I was 38, mm-hmm. and that all of a sudden was a hole in in me in my heart. And I have godsons, I have a niece and nephews, but I didn't have children. I didn't have a a husband or a partner either. I didn't have time. And I thought, how can I get children in my life? Never thinking of quitting my job at that point. So I called shelters. You know, we all live in, in cities, we all have newspapers and we all read those same stories of children being abused and neglected and being removed from home. So I started calling the police and I actually got some shelter names and called them and asked if I could come in at night and read to the children there. And I was welcomed. And when I went in and read to them, it was, it was like another being on another planet. They were so quiet, as you can imagine, they had been scooped up in in the middle of the night or, you know, from a place that was not safe from people who were not taking care of them, brought to this strange place just had what they were wearing, which was usually soiled and didn't fit. And they were so quiet and they brought them in. I sat on the floor with my books. I had my suits on and they sat down. I read stories and it was so quiet week after week. And finally, I followed where they were taking them to go to sleep at night. And the bedtime I saw was heartbreaking. And I flashed to my mom putting us to bed, which was incredibly warm and fuzzy and joyful and comforting and stable. And what I was looking at at the shelter, even though those staffers were so wonderful and warm, it's not the same as having a mom or dad tuck you into a bed. There were futons and couches and nothing to change into for the kids. So I brought pajamas the next week. Again, just thinking I was going to do this in my spare time when I could. I brought the pajamas, I read to the kids, and I started handing them out. One little girl wouldn't take them, but she wanted to watch me give them to the other kids. Finally, she was the last one again waiting. And I went over and I coaxed her and I pleaded for her to take the pretty pink pajamas that I knew would fit her. And she whispered to me, what are pajamas? And in that moment, that must have been a few weeks into my volunteering, everything changed in my head and it was almost physical. And I was, I was just, I felt this hole and, and I was actually explaining pajamas to a little girl and 
not understanding how I didn't know about this and not knowing what to do about it. And it took me the next few weeks of shopping and buying pajamas to realize that I was hardly paying attention to my job. So the thought of being a workaholic and then being so obsessed with these children and what I could do to help them in my spare time took maybe, maybe four weeks. And then it took a few months of really feeling my heart pulling me away from that corporate world. I just, I was afraid to look at it because I said, I'm supporting myself financially. I have built this career. What is this I'm thinking about doing? It does, it does, it's not even anything other than going around with pajamas. So that's sort of the first couple of months. After that, the people that wanted to help me, my friends and family, I knew that there was something there. But I'd say the whole process took about a year before I quit. The first six months, trying to do both, have two lives, was turning into a mess. I was getting into trouble at the office. I was sneaking in early and leaving late. And at that time, you couldn't have a cell phone with you, but I did because I didn't want to miss a call from a shelter staff worker. And I didn't want to miss a call from a friend of a friend who had pajamas to give me for the kids. So I was living two lives, which was really difficult. So it took about six months until I realized that this pajama thing could be something. And uh, before that, when I started with this obsession, I met a man who I was dating, began dating, and I was nervous to tell him I was thinking about quitting this big job and doing something with pajamas for children. But I said, I better ask him, you know, what he thinks because I'm not going to get in too deep if he thinks, you know, I'm crazy, just like some of my friends did. But his first reaction was go for it. And that said a lot. It said a lot to me. And he helped me with everything and I did marry him. And so in the first six months of having his support, some of my family, some of my friends support, I really thought this could be something, but I didn't know what. And then on a subway, my husband told me, meditate, ask what this is about. He does a lot of meditation. He teaches it actually. And I started to do that. And on the subway, I heard a voice in my head say pajama program and it was like a raindrop and I felt like it had come from the same place the question of if this is the next 30 years is this enough came from and I just trusted it and I had a name and I figured okay this is a real thing and I decided to try part-time and I promised my husband if I didn't make enough money for my share of the bills I'd work at McDonald's so it took about a year, I'd say, before I was fully living on the little savings I had and had made the jump. And it took a while before I was able to get any grants from pajama program. So it was skating on thin ice for over a year, a couple of years. So let's talk about that time when you left the job, you started the pajama thing. Did you ever have any self-doubt during that time? Every day. <laughs> Not that it wasn't a real thing and that it was that I could do it. It's the how. And I think when I speak and when I talk to people and certainly when I meet other nonprofit or any entrepreneur, I think we all know and believe we can do it, but we just don't have every step plan and we don't know how, but our determination is so strong and our belief in, you know, the invisible universe coming to us with the right people at the right time is something that we have to trust. So when you are starting anything new and certainly a nonprofit, it's always about the money. And it's always about finding the people that will pay or donate what you for what you have. So I would say most of my apprehension is what most entrepreneurs fear, and that's supporting ourselves. Why don't you explain what the pajama program is? Sure. 
Pajama Program provides new pajamas and new books as our magical gifts to children who don't have, don't have them and don't have the bedtime that they have a right to have. Bedtime means so much more than the material of pajamas or the story in a book. It's, it represents stability and comfort and love and routine and so many things that add to a child's relaxation and peace at night. And the children we serve are usually not at peace at night because of what they've been through and what they anticipate could happen tomorrow. So it brings them some peace and comfort at night so they can fall asleep, hopefully have fewer nightmares, and wake up with a better feeling than if than they might have without these gifts. So they wake up feeling, remembering somehow that somebody cares, they're in clothes that fit and feel comfortable, they had a storybook that was um, fun and theirs personally, a gift for them. And by helping this them to have a bedtime and a bedtime routine helps stabilize what is usually a real scary and unstable time for the kids that we serve. So by you finding this purpose, by giving back, got you to take a scary time in your life and leave the corporate world and go do your purpose. By taking that chance, starting the pajama thing, filling a need, helping people has opened up to other opportunities for you, like speaking, um, helping other nonprofits, coaching. Can you talk a little bit about that? Right. Well, it changed everything. As you can imagine, the people that, that I was surrounded by when I was climbing the corporate ladder were and are very different than those that I'm surrounded by now who are finding ways to give back and really our lives are consumed with our nonprofits. If we're founders or um, staffers who've made a career of nonprofit, it's a different mindset. Um, Yes, we need to live, we need to have money, but it's not all about the things that we can buy anymore. It's about the list of people or, or animals or the reason that we're doing what we're doing. It's about reaching more and more of those on the list. So after 20 years of being founder and executive director, I wanted to share the story of overcoming some scary times, the obstacles, things I learned, things I did right, things I did wrong, because I got, I've been getting so many calls over the years for advice from young newbies who want to do something in nonprofit or even entrepreneurs. And I, I love to tell our story because it's really about the human connection for any entrepreneur, for any nonprofit founder. It's about what happened to you to make you decide this is what you wanted to dedicate your life to. And I found when we share those stories, those very human stories, that human connection opens up so many possibilities. And funding is one of those possibilities because people who want to give back and are looking to donate or support, they want a human story. They want to feel what you're feeling. They want a connection. I know that there's a lot of research that people prepare to show how a dollar makes a difference and all of that is valuable. But at first, people want a human connection to why they should care about what you care about. And I think that's so important to remember because in this day and age, especially now, there's there are so many ways to connect. And you know, we do it on the phone, we do it on computer, we text, and there's less and less human interaction. And I don't want to lose that because it's all the devices are not a replacement for the human connection. And when you are one person who started something, I think that's the most important tool to use your face, your words, your presence in front of somebody else. Your experience. Absolutely. And good and bad. I share all the things I did wrong as well as all the things I did right. And even when some of those were just luck. (laughs) 
piggybacking on that, could you name one thing that you've done wrong, that you did wrong, that you wish that you could have changed? Well, the scariest, one of the scariest times that we had was when the recession came. 2008-ish. Yes. I had always tried to reach some of those rich Wall Streeters who, you know, were before that raking it in and choosing nonprofits and giving them a whole bunch of money. And I thought if we could just land one of those. And I tried, didn't work, never did. Recession came and I said, oh my goodness, we rely on, you know, grassroots. We have a few grants, but everybody's hurting. What's going to happen? And left and right, things were closing up. Nonprofits were going down. So were companies. You know, you remember, people remember the recession. Somebody said to me, let's have a bowl -a rama a bowling fundraiser. And I said, what? If I were to give you a list of the two things I hate, it's bowling number one and maybe pool number two. I was so against it. I said, I don't know why you think or anybody would think people coming to bowl is going to do it. But I was at my wit's end. These people said, listen, we can get our friends to come. We'll raise some money. We'll raise, we'll get some exposure. So I was reluctant, but I got into it. Let me tell you, it wasn't that we raised a million dollars, but what we raised was a rallying group that took that night of fun and spreading the word and learning about our kids and meeting each other. They took that rally to fundraising heights. And they left so high, so did I. I was shocked, shocked. I'll never forget it. Met new people, got calls for weeks after, heard about this through so-and-so, went bowling. And I can't tell you that resurrected us, but it was a big part of our psyche on what people will do when times are tough for something they believe in. And I took a chance. I would never have thought of it, didn't want to do it, went reluctantly, but I thank, thank God every day for those people, they know who they are, who said, let's go bowling. What is it, like one in six people, the ages 35 to 54 are unhappy with their career? What advice or tools would you suggest for them to get started? Yeah, it's very sad. And I think it's at a high point now and might even get higher. There's something in the air. I think, you know, it's an unsteady time. Um, nobody knows what's happening with so many different issues that we're facing in the world. And I think a lot of people like me are wondering, is this all there is? I've worked so hard. Uh, I've tried to split my time and nothing's feeling like I, I got my time. I have career and my employees aren't happy and there's no camaraderie and nobody cares and everybody's on their phones. And I, I feel that too. And I, when I talk and when I consult and coach, I've tried to impress upon them how important it is to figure out what makes your heart sing. And it's not a light question because so many of us are too busy to pay attention to the things we like to do because we have to pay the bills and the kids are sick and you know the money is running out or my boss wants this or I've got employees that want that. But if you're in a, a place at, in the, during the day that's not making your heart sing, take 20 minutes, sit down and make a list of 10 things off the top of your head that you love to do. Then circle the top three and really figure out how you can bring one or all three into your life for just an hour once a week, once every two weeks. And when you figure out which is the top one or the top two, really figure out if there's a way to work it into your office space. Maybe you like to play the piano. Do you have a keyboard you can bring into the office or your boss will let you play at lunchtime? Is there, do you love horses? Can you call up someone or do you already know someone who has horses? Can you spend more time? Because a lot of times you don't have to quit your job and change your career, but you have to include what makes your heart sing, what makes you happy into your life in some way. 
And I think a lot of employers are open to this. There are a lot of talks about incorporating employee loves in the workspace so that there is more camaraderie. There are people who care about each other and who care about the work they're doing if there's a part of them that is fulfilled. So you don't have to jump off the corporate ladder that I did. If you want to, that's great. That's another discussion. But you need to find time for those things that touch your heart. You mentioned when you went <clears throat> when you went on your own that you you know you had some great things. You've had some luck, and you know you had quite a bit adversity. What advice would you give to someone? Well, I'll say once they hit rock bottom, once that true adversity hits. I think I think a lot of us think it's supposed to be one way that. We're supposed to reach our goal in this one way. And we go down that and we do everything that we think is going to lead us to the pot of gold. And I think the minute you let go of the way it's supposed to go and you look for the detours and you knock on new doors and you talk to new people, that you'll find another way opens up. And that's happened like with the bowling thing, it it's always at a scary time when we almost give up that we try something because we think we have nothing to lose. And more times than not, that proves to be a route that's just as good or better than what we were so fixed on adhering to. So I think when you hit rock bottom and you're in that place where you don't know you have nothing to lose, reach out to people that you haven't reached out to. Open your mind to different ways. Look for different connections or a different way to get to the next step and go one step at a time. Don't don't think if you're at rock bottom, how are you going to get the million dollars? Think how are you going to get $100 or $1,000 in a way that's maybe uncomfortable or new? or asking somebody that you've not asked before. I'm all about asking strangers for help. Talk to everybody. So I think think you have to let your brain let go of the way you think it's supposed to be. And once you start opening up to different possibilities, you'll see glimmers of hope in a different direction, and and you got to follow that. How and when do you know you've done things right? Oh, <laughs> I guess for for me, it's looking at realizing that I've been able to help more more people on my list. So I think when you're able to help more people or or do more of what you wanted to do every day, every week, or every month, then you know you're doing something right. So I think you have to look at who you're serving if you're a nonprofit or who you're working with if you're an entrepreneur. And when you start when you start seeing that you're helping more, then you know that you're doing something right. For, for nonprofit funders, it's raising money. Um, and then that allows us to reach more people. For entrepreneurs, it's getting more clients or more customers. But I think it all depends on who you're serving and seeing that go up. What do you fear the most and how are you facing it? What do I fear the most? Yeah. And what are you doing about it? I still fear um, a lot of things. I still fear... um, not. I'm all about connecting and telling our story and hoping that it connects with people to inspire them to get themselves out of a rut or to believe that they can do what they really want to do and it's not too late. And I, I hope that I'm not too late with what I'm doing to help, to help people because most of the time, I'm talking to people who are in a place that is it's possible for them to 
find happiness or find more fulfillment. And every time I do that and people are inspired or ask me to help them get to that place, it's a good day. When I meet people who tell me there are so many reasons they can't do what they want to do, whether it's financial reasons, they don't have support from their partners, they have children who are, are, are sick, heartbreaking reasons they can't do it. I'm always afraid I've not done enough. I haven't reached the part of them that says, I understand all that, but there's a way for you. And if I, if I feel like they're walking away still overwhelmed with the reasons they can't find some meaning in their life, that's heartbreaking for me personally. That's, that's a disappointment for me. That's, that's a fear that I will be faced with people who just are overwhelmed and I can't reach them. Earlier, you mentioned um, when we talked about you know taking chances and you said leaving your corporate job and that was a whole other conversation. What did you mean by that? I mean, if do you have a a plan or an outline? Yeah, I did not have a plan. Um, I did not, and I I usually don't, and and that's why I always say I I jump in the water and and then I figure out how to swim. I just start splashing around, moving my arms and legs, and finding finding a way. You know, if there's not a way, I'll find a way. I'll make a way, and I think that a lot of entrepreneurs and and founders are the same in that we feel so strongly, we have such a conviction that we literally move mountains and shock ourselves because we just believe it, believe in it so strongly. And if you stop, when I stop and think about it, it's really scary. I didn't have a plan for pajama program for years. And my first five-year plan was my pen on lined paper. And it's, I think it's as much of your intention as it is about opening your mouth and talking to people and asking questions and asking for what you want and going to the top as it is about sitting with professionals and mapping out a detailed plan on paper. I think it's, I think there's something to be said about the energy and the mystery and the intention and the conviction of one person. Because I talk about the power of one and the secret. And the secret of the power of one is it's the power of one another. And I think the more like the bowling, I think the more people that rally with you and for you and for what you all as a group want to accomplish that there's magic in it and that there's mystery and and success in that commitment of not just you, but those that you attract to you. A little, that's a little spiritual, but I'm into that. So I've seen it happen. And then I can tell you, you know, 25 years ago, I, I believed in anything, but now I, I know, I don't just believe, I know that so much is possible with that conviction, energy, and one another human connection ability. Well, you have an experience at it now. You've lived it. It's just like like you're not talking about it. You've actually done it. And it's really funny that you, the way you explain that is totally how I work. But what I've had in the last few weeks is conversations with people that are stuck and they've got this plan. I keep hearing over and over, well, it's not perfect yet. Well, guess what? It's never perfect. Never gonna be perfect. You're right. <laughs> it's always messy. Yes. Just do yeah. I don't want to have this conversation. <laughs> I mean, there's one particular gentleman I've had the conversation for a year. I'm like, it's the same conversation. Just go. It's yeah. never gonna be perfect. And it's gonna yep. be messy. But you yep. gotta go. For having a, a a plan on a piece of paper, what was it, five or six years afterwards, you ended up getting to sit down with Oprah. Yeah. What was going through your mind, like leading up and then like maybe sitting in the green room waiting for your time? Like what were those self-talks like? Well, first of all, uh, along with everything that we're talking about, that 
Oprah experience came out of visualization, vision board, you know, the same type of trusting the universe, using the universe as your partner. Miracles happen because my husband said to me, let's sit on a park bench and let me do a meditation with you. And let's see if, if you want to do the visualization with me. And he threw out there, you know, what do you want? And I said, I want, want Oprah to know about this. You know, she has the power to share it. He said, okay, let's visualize that. And I literally said, are you crazy? You know how every single person on, on the earth wants to meet her and ha- ask her to help them. And it's just another example for me that anything is possible with intention and, you know, having that goal and putting pen to paper. You know, when I write what I want and, and people teach the whole visualization process and it's about your intent and putting a, a picture or a word on paper that you look at and it, it, the universe brings it to you. It's, it's crazy, but there's a whole you know, science to it in addition to the spiritual thing. So when I got the call, I, I don't know how I answered the producer's questions in a cohesive way because half of my brain was saying, what? I'm talking to the producer of the Oprah Winfrey. She called me and my half of my brain was, you know, in this, how did this happen? And the other half was making sense, answering her questions like a normal person, but I was not feeling very normal. I was, I was scattered in my brain. So she, she called because people had been writing in about this, this woman giving pajamas to kids, I guess that's what she said. So they called and there are so many funny stories. She interviewed me several times. I never told a soul. I didn't want to jinx it. And finally, she it was maybe five weeks of uh, one or two calls a week. She said, okay, I'm going to book you. And I said, so can I tell my husband? And she laughed and she said, you haven't told him? I said, nope, I haven't told anybody. So there were so many funny things that, that happened on the way. There was a snowstorm and we were so afraid our plane wasn't going to take off. We were supposed to tape the next day. We got there midnight. The producer and I were on the phone so many times about the takeoff time and the snowstorm and everything. We got there in midnight, you know, maybe five hours later than we were supposed to. And the producer called to give me a rundown for the next morning. And she told me what to expect. And she said, you'll be in the audience and Oprah's going to introduce you and you're going to, um, walk up the steps onto the stage and hop onto a stool next to Oprah. I never heard anything else she said after that because all I could think was hop on a stool. (laughs) What happened to the couch that I could lower myself into without falling? And I was sitting, you know, it got into the auditorium or the, the audience thinking that all the questions they prepped me with in the weeks before were what Oprah was going to ask me. But if you watch the video, you can find it on YouTube. You can find it on my email, on my website. You will see that they had a big surprise in store. So there were so many things that they were asking that didn't make sense to me. So many things that were happening. They were taking me all, all over the place to get to the stage and I was thinking, this must be a new intern because she's getting lost. Like she keeps changing the route to the stage. And it was because they had things hidden mm. that she was hearing in her earphone, not to go this way, not to go that way. They were hiding things from me. And when the reveal happened, it was an explosion between me and Oprah and the audience. And then obviously we found out the viewers because it was taped and everything exploded in the most wonderful way. And I don't want to give it away in case you haven't seen it or anybody hasn't seen it because it's more fun to watch it than to hear me talk about it. But you will see um, you will see what happened that was a total shock. What question did I not ask you that I should have? Oh, boy. You asked a lot of really good questions. Really, really great questions. Had me thinking and remembering things. It's really, It's really been great talking to you and really... I'm really glad that you brought up the visualization because that's something that I've really been studying lately. Like the science behind uh, visualization, especially like in sports. This is what these athletes do. Oh, yes. 
I'm I'm so interested in it. Um, do you have any suggestions for people to start vis- visualization or imagery? Can you see mine? So you got Can your you storyboard see? right there. Yeah. You see it? Okay. This yep. is this is and I call it this is Jen's fabulous life now. And you know, I have my umbrella title and all the different ways that I'm going to reach um, what I want. That's all under the Find Your Pajamas umbrella. And it's everything from my speaking engagements to the PR I want to family to trips. So I have that here with me. And I think it's, if I were to tell somebody to do something, I would say, and I, and I do this with my nephews, with my, anybody I can grab, get a piece of, we used to call it Oak Tag, poster board, buy 10 magazines that you love get a bunch of markers, get a scissor and tape and spend three hours on the floor or at a table and go through the magazines and cut out the pictures that touch you. Not that your brain says, oh, this is a, a dollar sign. I want to make money. I cut this out. Cut out the pictures that touch you, the life that you want, the people you want to meet, the words that jump off the page. And just make a big collage and put it somewhere you can see it every day and just believe that is your life because it is never too late, never too late. I was 38, never thought I would jump off the corporate ladder, just thought I was going to go higher. And I meet people every day who, you know, I'm always jealous of those who are 28, but I meet people who are my age and older who have decided, no. If this is the next 30 years of my life, this is not enough. So it's never too late to start making that change. We'll wrap it up with where can people find you and any last words right now? Um, my website is genevievepituro.com. And every day I feel the fear and I do it anyway. I start something new. I make a call. I talk to somebody. I muster up the courage <clears throat> to. Do something uncomfortable because I don't want to be 85. Do that rocking chair test where I picture myself in the rocking chair with a whole bunch of wishes that I had done. I want to be in that rocking chair at 85 or 95 thinking, well, I gave everything a shot. And I'm here to say most of it worked. Because if you give everything a shot, most of it will work. I think one of my favorite failures were actually my university. Didn't get the grades that I wanted to get. I definitely struggled. Looking at my grades, you would think I'm a failure. I felt like a failure for quite a long time, judging myself based on my scores and my GPA. But one of the biggest things that I've learned is I am not a number. I am not where I was. I only dictate where I'm going. Quote unquote, one of my biggest failures, but also one of my biggest powers, because it's also one of my biggest driving forces that I will not be determined by a couple of numbers. 